X-Corp number one introduces, for the time, the 13th title in the Krakoa era X-Men line, with a focus on the business management side of mutant dominance in the reign of X, led by X-Corp CXOs Monet St. Croix and Warren Worthington. Today I'll answer, what's the role of X-Corp in the Hickman era of X-Men? No, seriously, I'm asking. I'd really like to know. I don't understand. <laughs> That's what I'm going to talk about here today. Who's on the board of X-Corp and who is Trinary? New Mutant, and what's her role here? Hey, everybody, you're listening to Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You're listening to Cracking Krakoa, number 179, a review of the new series launch of X-Corp number one. Again, you can find all of the X-Men comic reading orders over on ComicBookHerald.com. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting here. It all helps me out a great, great deal. Spoilers for Discuss Comics will definitely follow. Writer Teeny Howard, artist Alberto Foche, colors Sonny Gao, letters by Clayton Cowles. The story opens with a very corporate promotion for X-Corp from CXO's Warren Worthington III, Angel, and Manet St. Croix, a.k.a. M, a.k.a. Penance. The duo was teased as owning the X-Corp arm of mutant relations way back in Empire X-Men, as well as the Reign of X teaser that Marvel led into 2021. And here X-Corp is officially on the verge of going public, expanding the ways Krakoa and mutant kind intersect with human, technological, pharmaceutical, and business interests. Angel and Monet are an interesting pair here driving the business because both share a more dangerous other half, Monet with her penance form, which we see in this issue, and Angel famously with Archangel, granted to him by Apocalypse way back in 1988's Fall of the Mutants. We do get the slogan, or a teased slogan potentially here, from Monet, which is, we're simply superior. It's clever, right, for homo superior, but it also feels like a pretty bad slogan for human mutant public relations, I would say, to once again reiterate your superiority and dominance, true as it may be. So we see Monet and Angel connect with Professor X on the plans for X-Corp and how it will expand mutant presence beyond the Krakoan drugs they've already distributed and already are distributing via Emma Frost and the Hellfire Trading Company's networks. Monet, as a character here, I think is challenging. I think she has historically been a very interesting and strong character, but the way she acts here is uh, she does not come across particularly... I don't know, like like a team player, right? Like she's very dismissive of Warren as co-CXO in a way that I actually didn't think was helping her, whereas the way they sort of dismissed Warren in Empire X-Men herself and Magic was actually very funny. Um, I also thought it was dismissive, you know, later in the comic of killing a bunch of Jamie Madrox's dupes and losing research into Krakoan processing. It's a very unfeeling sort of, uh, you know, character dynamic that is not way off base necessarily with what she's been in the past, but I think what is happening Happening is she's intentionally being written as this character sort of losing control to her penance side of things okay we see that roll into the issue a little bit here and I think that's going to be a big thing going forward but for the time being it made her sort of interactions with others a little difficult to understand at least for me before we continue I'm interested in exploring why this comic exists and honestly the comic itself does not do a great job at answering that question so let's look at how we got here in House of X number one, we're introduced to the flowers of Krakoa, these life-changing drugs that extend human life, provide antibiotics, and cure diseases of the mind. This gift, or more accurately, the opportunity to pay for the drugs, is given in exchange for mutant severity and freedom on Krakoa. It also means immeasurable wealth for Professor X and mutant kind. The wealth matters, because as we learn in X-Men number four, this is what Magneto views as the grand plan for mutant superiority on Earth buying leverage over all human institutions. A huge part of the mutant plan for the reign of X right now is to leverage ownership of everything humans hold dear. This cuts to the why this matters of it all, because if you think about it purely in terms of wealth and power and all that, mutant kind has everything it needs on Krakoa, and they will outlast humans in their institutions with the resurrection protocols. So what wealth and power ensures is not actually the ability to use that in ways that humanity would, for example, as we'll see later, you know, buying a hybrid horse racetrack or something, but instead to control institutions in such a way that Earth is a world safe for mutant kind. So given the background, on paper, X-Corp's role is extremely clear. This is the book about mutant business, about the ways Professor X and Krakoa's massive wealth and life-changing pharmaceuticals are utilized for humanity outside of the mutant nation, and to highlight the roadmap for how Magneto's plan is actualized, which I think is probably the most interesting potential role. 
In the first issue, though, that clarity of purpose is far from present. In a lot of ways, I think X-Corp has similar problems as Excalibur, the other Teeny Howard written X-Men comic, and that is that it has a muddled mission statement and it's kind of missing the forest for the trees. Like the concept of what it should be is stated in the build. I think it's right there. But does the work actually make it clear why it exists within the text itself? I don't think this first issue does that. Why do we need an X-Corp book? What questions is it answering? How is it additive to this very interesting era of X-Men? Look at the two most recent successful number ones in the line, Sword Number 1 and Way of X. Very deliberate, delineated roles in both of these stories told expertly, right? We have a mutant space program in Sword, and we have mutant religion and sort of what is our purpose here as told through the lens of Nightcrawler in Way of X. Perhaps more importantly, both books ask big questions with tons of potential for where mutant kind can go in this era. That makes them very, very interesting, okay? Asking these huge questions about sort of how does this fit in, again, like what makes this unique? What makes this specific to the Krakoa era? And I think with X-Corp, that's a challenge right now, right? It's, yes, specifically, okay, this is the first time mutant kind has been selling these drugs in a post-House of X landscape and all that, but it's not like mutants haven't owned businesses before, right? X-Corp is a concept concept is something that dates back to Grant Morrison's work in New X-Men. So it, that sort of thing says to me, okay, this story could have been told other times, other ways. Why are we telling it here? Why are we telling it now? And I don't think X-Corp number one really answers that question. Now, as far as the comic itself, Angel, he is in Brazil negotiating with Jean-Pierre Cole, who apparently was seen in House of X number one, I think is one of the individuals who was in the um, I, the Jerusalem habitat with Magneto's, you know, cool, you have new gods now speech, again, in Hawks number one. Uh, you know, one thing I do want to mention here, while Warren is negotiating and, and having this conversation with this businessman who is clearly trying to, you know, strong arm mutant kind, essentially, we have Alberto Forte's art here, which is all generally fine um not super it's a bit flat i'll say it doesn't stand out a ton to me except for one particular thing which is gene pierre cole is apparently racing like hybrid horses like one of these horses on fire some of them have wings like it's wild <laughs> it's super weird and it just kind of left me like big dub like wtf energy and also like like this is never commented upon like no one no one says anything about like the the just strangeness of like the fact that he's racing a horse on fire it's just happening um which i guess is just a thing you can do when you're crazy rich like maybe that's the implication but i found that kind of strange i mean the 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 real comment here though is like you have a david aha cover right to this issue and i honestly i kind of think it does x-corp a disservice because with the actual sort of flat visuals you know hybrid horses aside now it's just making me wish this book was more inventive right like david aha is known for incredibly inventive layouts for incredibly inventive sort of minimalist design you know of course with hawkeye with Matt Fraction probably being the most celebrated example. If you're going to tell a corporate business comic, you know, standard flat comic book storytelling and just sort of like very, you know, structural panel layouts, it's not doing you any favors. I think you have to get more interesting than that. You have to play to the strengths of the fact that like you're telling a comic about the business world. Use weird graphs, use charts, use use all the stuff that like Hickman loves, right? Or, or look at like what David Baldion's doing in X Factor, you know, just getting inventive with layout, with visual so that the thing isn't so stagnant this is a very stagnant first issue so the plan here from this brazilian billionaire is okay he owns noblesse pharmaceuticals they're suing krakoa over a savage land flower processing facility and i think this taps into one of the challenges with x-corp and, and also some of the potential which is like how about some investigation exploration or elaboration of Krakoan pharmaceuticals. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but like, again, this is a big thing that was thrown out there. It is a huge driving force of why the Krakoa era works is this idea that Professor X and the mutants have, you know, they, they have this product now and basically they're able to live safely or you know it's safer than they've ever been in some ways on the island of Krakoa because they have something to offer humanity to sort of keep them placated 
exploring the reaction to that and exploring the actual like usage of that product i think is extremely interesting as is this like the fact that they even have a savage land processing plant <laughs> like that's like fairly new information that alone the fact that jamie madrix is there working and all his dupes are, are exploring and investigating like what are they what are they learning about queer Cohen pharmaceuticals that stuff's interesting so the big bad evil super billionaire he blows up the savage land plant okay so he's his plan is to like sue them but then blow them like blow it up first but then sue them for blowing up the land i I think and uh you know he says they'll blame your risky mutant engineering i've made sure of that so he's trying to frame the mutants now it's not made particularly clear in this issue but there is an interesting idea here that cole is destabilizing trust and faith in krakoan technology and ostensibly also their drugs again the acceptance of krakoan drugs remains one of the more brushed aside elements from house of x and i'm actually very interested in public perception there's a danger of over literalizing the metaphor, but we live in a world where far too many people won't get vaccinated to stave off a pandemic. You're telling me humanity would be mostly accepting of mutant mystery drugs? Let's dig into that a little bit. Like, I'd be curious, what are the ramifications? What is that world like? Um, And how are Kirkcoan drugs actually being used and leveraged? And like, what is the impact? Like, we have not seen, to my knowledge, that this drug cures diseases of the mind. Like, do we have these miracle stories of, of dementia and Alzheimer's being like removed? from individuals i don't know that we've actually seen any examples of this and that is you know kind of like there's a there's potential story there now before flying into rescue warren from this brazilian situation monet collects her new board uh for x corp she connects trinary and Jamie Madrox, a.k.a. the Multiple Man. Since Trinary is far newer than Jamie, I'll focus there. For those unfamiliar with Jamie's deal, uh, you bonk him and you get another him. He makes duplicates of himself, and they can all retain unique personalities and knowledge sets, but ultimately they're a part of Jamie. He's quirky and fun, and for a spell was a pretty good noir detective. Also, his relationship with Monet from their days in Peter David written X-Factor. So, on the board, though, you get Trinary as well. Trinary debuted in 2018's X-Men Red by Tom Taylor and Mamad Asrarf, easily one of my favorite X-Men comics of the Forgotten Era, aka the gap between Avengers vs. X-Men and Hickman, circa, you know, 2012 to 2019. Trinary is a technopathic mutant who, during X-Men Red, repurposed a Sentinel for her own doing. Her references here to established criminality in India is based on her basically Robin Hooding wealth from the richest men in India to every woman in India. She's a really cool new character, and more of her is a good thing. I look forward to seeing her get more spotlight in this Krakoan era and as part of X Corporation. So, again, like, this is... We see Monet load up on the, uh, what is it, the X-Corp headquarter, and it, it takes off, okay? The, the X-Corp headquarters is state-of-the-art, and not only that, it can fly. Um, maybe I'm a little spoiled by comics here, but the fact that X-Corp's headquarter can fly, like, this is played up to be, like, this shocking, remarkable thing, and... I mean, we're in the Marvel Universe. (laughs) Like, this is a universe with helicarriers, uh, mutants living on sentient islands. Why is this shocking? (laughs) Like, this this doesn't feel as uh, strange or as new or as fresh in the Marvel Universe specifically as I think it's kind of played up to be. Uh, Regardless, Monet X Corp, they use the spaceship X Corp headquarters to, uh, yeah, they use the Nova Roma Krakoan Gate hidden in the jungles of Brazil to enter Brazilian airspace and extract Warren, who, again, is, like, literally coming under fire, and they're all being shot at by these Brazilian guards, um, which is feels to me like a declaration of war, but is not played up that way. Uh, Monet says their flashy entrance into Brazil overshadows the destruction of the facility in the Savage Land. She says it's not even trending, which, like, <laughs> why, why would it be? <laughs> like, in the Savage Land, a plant blew up? Like, is Kazar a big tweeter? You know? Like, is Shauna the She-Devil? Like, is she, like, big Instagram presence? <laughs> Maybe she does. I don't know. Let's dig into that. I would love to see the data page on uh, how fast news in the Savage Land spreads. What is the relevance of all this, of mutant business? I mean... In x Corps number one, I just think it feels remarkably insular. You know, it feels like a story in and about itself. And the thing about Hickman's X-Men number four is the way it speaks to financial institutions owning and controlling ways of the world that translates to our own world. It's Hickman distilling Black Monday murders, you know, his creator-owned Image comic series down to, like, you know, a single conversation. But again, like, it's relevant. Like, it means something. You can see the ways it connects. Warren Worthington negotiating with a hostile Brazilian businessman who's, again, is, like, very super villain mustache twirly and his convoluted plan to blow up a savage land plant and then sue mutants for operating on that land like what is that (laughs) like what is that what am i supposed to make of that i i just don't totally know there's a roadmap and an appetite for the inner workings of massive wealth and business you know like 
HBO Succession, you have billions. You have even something like The Boys on Amazon Prime with satire of corporate superheroes, right? Like there's an appetite for this content. Now, if you were out on it just on a like, I don't want to celebrate massive wealth alone scale, sure. But like there are ways to do this extremely entertainingly. And I feel like despite those roadmaps, despite those templates, X Corp isn't grabbing any of them or or even look like to the comics like something like in grant morrison's uh marvel boy from the early 2000s uh he has a living corporation and i forget the name of that character but like make it absurd make it marvel make it strange something like that i just i don't know what the angle here is on x corp um honestly like at the end of the day x corp number one it's a poorly worded corporate email that fails to delineate roles responsibilities and anticipated deliverables for future issues it's a very flat comic I am unexcited by it. By comparison to Children of the Atom number one, which is a challenge debut, it has a clear mystery. Like Children of the Atom number one, I think is a messy first issue, but it has a clear reason to keep reading. I don't know what that is for X Corp right now beyond, you know, I'm obsessed with mutants, right? And like, it's a fine comic, <laughs> you know, it's fine. It gets the job done. If you like these characters, you'll probably dig it. And that's kind of been Howard's thing with Excalibur too. Like if you like Betsy Braddock, what a comic. Amazing, right? Great work. If you like uh, Psylocke, good stuff. Um, but again, like big picture in terms of what it's contributing, in terms of just sort of the style, there's not a ton to hang your hat on. And the thing that probably bums me out the most about this launch is like, I don't know what to look forward to. What should I be anticipating? There's rounding out the board, I guess, like the literal, you know, council board, which might already be decided. It could be Monet, Warren, Professor X, Trinary, Madrox, but maybe we've got others that they're going to put in. I'm not clear. And maybe there's sort of a what interest industries are they expanding into next question? You know, like, okay, they have pharmaceuticals, like, what's next um are they gonna release new drugs are they gonna release te like forge technology or something like that like uh, there's potential there but big picture you know I, I just think that question of like why does it matter why is it important that's that's unclear and that's a bad thing for a first issue you know like you're trying to sell people to to buy onto again like the 13th comic now in the x-men line for a lot of fans already saying like yeah there's a lot here and I, I don't think, unfortunately, that X Corp number one carves its way in in the way that other successful first issue launches, again, Sword and Way of X, just in the last, you know, five months, have done. Um, I, I hope it gets better. I really do. And on a final note, listen, clearly I'm not the biggest fan of Teeny Howard's contributions to the X line thus far, um, X of Swords notwithstanding. Criticism of anyone's comics is totally fair game, but I want to be clear that I do not support attacks of a personal nature or the inordinate amount of rage I see thrown Howard's way in comments on my videos and elsewhere. Like or dislike the comic and talk about that, but do not think that I am here to support any of the hate-mongering BS I see too often, okay? Not something I am into, all right? So, but otherwise, absolutely, let me know your theories. Let me know your comments. Do you totally disagree? Did you love this issue? Do you think there's immense potential and it's great and everything is awesome? Uh, I want to hear that. Like, leave, your, leave your thoughts in the comments as well. The Crick Cohen for this issue, um, basically like every issue coming out this month says, you know, Hellfire Gala, which is coming up next. I, I have to think too, like... This book getting immediately thrown into the Hellfire Gala tie-ins, that worries me. <laughs> that worries me a little bit too, because Sword is probably the clearest example where Sword number one launched. It's the best number one issue in my book since House of X number one. Um, and then it gets thrown in the King and Black event. And definitely that slowed it down, but also it had such a strong launch that I was more willing to watch, you know, Al Ewing, who's very good at working into tie-ins, you know, kind of get get sidelined or get distracted a little bit by that with x corp without a strong number one now getting thrown into a hellfire gala tie-in i just think it's kind of going to mean it's going to take the series even longer to get its footing and uh that that feels off so it feels like kind of a missed opportunity here on the launch hopefully it can kind of recover here in a first arc hey thanks everybody for listening uh i'm dave you can support my stuff at patreon.com slash comic book herald thanks so much to the mysterious benefactors who support the site at the mysterious benefactors tier level thank you jesse w megan getman cole weathers martin lopez chris isidro brent bowser professor x3769 richard renz verisimilitude terranort ed Mackey, clyde to glide pinball drew mike solomons matt mahoney and john samander again you can find all my stuff at comicbookherald.com at comicbookherald on social look for the best comics ever in my marvel this year podcast for more from me thanks everybody for listening and as always enjoy the comics <laughs>